Greetings everyone and welcome back to Factorio where as you can see I have set up the miners for copper We've even got a couple of extra uh, Radars and generally things are going reasonably well the way the radars work by the way is that they will scan a, a number of chunks out from themselves so by having all of my radars close together they're not going to scan a larger area but they will scan their the area that they can cover much faster uh once they the the pattern they work is in an ever expanding circle or, or square in this case around themselves so once that is covered there we go it started on the the next layer and it'll go out until it can't go any further and generally as a result it's better to space your radars out at the moment we've only got one concern and it's fairly close together so it doesn't matter that we've got them all very tightly packed also radars do produce pollution I believe I mentioned that in an earlier episode that pollution isn't strictly the sort of like you know toxic waste pollution or anything like that it is also sound uh, anything which might generate interest from the biters or, or the uh, alien life forms on the planet or rather native life forms I suppose I get the impression the way more of the aliens it is going to hurt my brain for a long time that we've got iron chest there eventually we will get rid of them uh right now then let's have a quick look at our research currently we are able to start looking into different types of rail we can increase the braking force of our trains which would mean that because they can slow down faster they can maintain a higher speed for longer uh, but we're not really going to worry about that one what we really want is ultimately to be able to make automated rail systems because until you have this research really all you've got is a rapid transport system that you can manually use to get from one side of a base or from one outpost to another uh, so on and so forth really we want these quite quite badly uh now let's have a look down here at my completed ones ah good we have got the circuit network very well there's a couple of things that we can do with this marvelous thing um hmm. we also do need to set up some construction of gun turrets uh, that is a fairly simple one to make requires 10 iron gears takes eight seconds to make 20 iron plates as well so we're going to need a blue uh, manufacturing uh, blue assembling machine rather uh, fair enough the components for that are a regular assembling machine which is fine we've already got everything we really need there so we'll go ahead and manufacture this we're also going to want uh, one for the the gear wheels as well we can produce enough gear wheels in the time that we have because we produce two gears per second so in five seconds we'll have the ten gears so we don't need more than one so if we're only going to be using a single uh, factory for this one and I see no particular reason not to do so uh, in fact down here we could expedite the process a little bit by pulling off this line but I'm I'm reluctant to do that ge as a general rule uh, in fact let's uh, not cluster things too aggressively together i'm generally uh, against the idea of uh, pulling from a, a line down here that's got just happens to have extra gears on it because i may want to expand out my red science facility and then it gets a little bit complicated uh, the more the more different uh, connections you set up like that there we go we are going to want both iron and copper on this side eh it's it's not the best setup um alternatively i could do something like that we can have iron going up on one side copper going up on the other and that should actually be quite easy to set up now in this episode once we've got uh, turrets being produced i'm thinking that i would very much like to set up some really basic uh networks uh, sorry uh circuit setups just to demonstrate some of the things you can do nothing particularly important just yet but just little bits and bobs that might make uh your work in the factory a, a tiny bit easier there we go we'll take all of these because i am going to use them all in time uh, there we go perfect so we have everything coming through that we could possibly want and we will be storing these right there now all that remains is to bring over a little bit of power uh, alas we can't quite do that unless we do this and then we're still a little bit shy so eh. oh well it'll work there we are and that should all do its thing now this will probably based on the the speed 
of the inserters and how much this requires it needs 10 copper 20 iron and 10 iron gears if we pop down a second one it's just going to speed this up we could of course just go ahead and make a fast inserter uses a little bit more power than the regular inserter which uses 13 kilowatts this will use 46 and so by a little i mean quite a lot more uh, it also uses more um materials to make one but it saves space in the factory so if you're not worried about uh, your energy quite so much you can do that it'll, it'll get things sorted at this point that inserter is going to be holding us back a little bit so let's make another fast inserter and then we should be should be good there we go we don't want many of these made so we'll just limit it there there we are now there are lots of ways now that we've unlocked the circuit network to do this automatically i'm going to make a bunch of colored cables that we're going to be able to use to set up logical um, conditions on our inserters activating or even just um displays in fact one of the the first displays we can set up and this is it's never necessary, but it's quite fun to do, in my opinion. Uh, we're going to need a little bit more iron first, though. So let me... Uh, yeah, sure. I'll just take 100 out of there. We don't need more than that. We'll grab two groups of lights. Now, we're going to set these up in sequence along here. We'll have it uh, five along, five at the top as well. And this will just tell me how much uh, iron or copper I have in storage. You can set this up to, to read the belts, and I'll also, also display how we can do that. And this is possibly one of the simplest circuits that you can set up, but also uh, one that actually has some reasonable um, return on investment. It's very easy to build a circuit in this game that you don't really need. I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, the vast majority of circuits are completely unnecessary. They're, they're put there because you want to work in a different way. You can either work hard or you can work smart, is, is the general rule of things. Or you can work fast. But let's not get into, into the whole way that that all interacts together and the whole uh, engineering adage. But uh, do, with circuits, I often find that I'm building something that I don't actually need in any way. In fact, it might be faster if I just brute forced it. But, uh I enjoy playing around and occasionally by just seeing if I can do something I might learn of a thing that I could do that would actually have benefit it wasn't what I was trying to do but as with, with much science actually some of the best discoveries are completely by accident so we have these little uh, lights here and what I would like these to do is read how much we have in storage now the way you can do this we're going to need a constant combinator and let's be a little bit fancy about this we'll get two decider combinators as well now the first thing to do with anything like this hook them we can hook them up to uh, a wire now we'll just use this all on a single chest for now and we connect this light wire up to all of these lights there we go now if we look at this let's say we were dealing with a chest uh let's see one two three four five six seven eight nine ten that's very nice so 30 32 Okay, that's fairly easy. 3,200 potential um, iron can be held in there. So let's, let's round that to 3,000 just so it's nice and simple and uh, breaks down a little bit easier. So we want to check if we've got iron plates, say, greater than zero, then this will be turned on. Nice and easy. If our iron plates are greater than 600 then this one will be turned on there we go and we'll copy that across and just change the amount so this one should be 1200 it'll turn on this one should be 1800 there we are and this one should be if it's greater than 2400 then that one will turn on nice and simple so far uh, that will obviously as this fills up it'll get uh, better and better and better uh, do we have a lot in there we kind of do let me uh, grab a few plates just to demonstrate this system uh, you can already see the what I'm aiming for though I'm sure let's pop that in there and uh, clean up the belt back here so we can do this there we go perhaps I should have done copper really it would have been a better uh, display since that one is so much more backed up but here we are let's uh, fill these in there there we are so the third light is turned on now you could just leave it at that 
and it's a visual display oh yes you know we've we've got a certain amount they'll only turn on based on it you can just read how many lights are on to give you a general indication but you can get a little bit more uh, a little bit more creative than that now the reason why i made these combinators the first one i would like to uh color these lights we want we want kind of like a, a traffic light system so i'm going to run this down there and then across now the reason why i've connected up here is so that I can have this also output signal onto this wire. Uh, though I, I guess I didn't actually quite cover what the wire was doing here. This red wire interacts differently to the to the copper one. It is a copper wire, just a little bit uh, more uh, involved. It requires more components to make. These basically create uh, an actual network of information. The copper wire does not transmit this. It only transmits power. But the red and the green wires can transmit information data. By connecting it to a chest, there's really only one thing you can do with that, and that's read the content. So it's giving me a signal that's telling me what's in that chest. And we can look here, there's 1.6k iron plates in there. If we put something else in there, then it would also read that. It would be added as a different signal. These are now individual pieces of data traveling along the network. We don't need that for now, though. What I would like here is I would like to place in a yellow signal. Now, the way that this works, this is a constant combinator. Think of this as a, if anyone, uh, one of you uh, does anything with programming, this is a constant variable. It is always this amount, never changes. Uh, there we go. I can turn it on or off. We want it to be on. Uh, so this is now sending a yellow signal along this network. And I want to make all of these lights. They're currently set to enable or disable based on the condition. And I want them to use colors. So right now, all I've done is swap the white for yellow. Not really that useful. The next step, however, is, well, let's move. Yeah, we'll move these just a tad further along. There we go. And uh, we're going to need to drop down a little bit of power there as well. So let me just quickly make that. There we go. And that will power these. These ones, most combinators do actually require power. I'm not actually sure that the... Uh, that the yeah the, the constant combinator doesn't it's one of the only ones that doesn't now what i would like to do here is if the iron plates in the network are less than some arbitrary amount let's say a fairly low amount so let's say this one turns on if it's above zero this one will be turned on if it's above 600 so let's say if this is below 600 then i would like to output a red signal on just just one and this one should be the the green amount. So if, if we have iron plates above this uh, amount, then I would like you to output a green signal. There we go. And let's let's decide about the, the, the halfway mark. So let's say 1,600 in here. There we are. Now, currently, they're not doing anything. They're not receiving any signal whatsoever. So let's just run that across now these combinators have an input and an output and they can take both red and green on each one that is worth keeping in mind let me just uh, turn off the overlay so it's a little bit clear you see these little nodes there for the different wires now any signal sent in will be used in the central combination so although red and green wires in general are distinct and separate. They carry different information that doesn't bleed into each other. For example, in here, all of the iron plates are being merged together. Uh, if I added this chest there and, and hooked it up with a red wire, then it would be the combination of all of the iron plates in both of the chests uh, summed together. But if I connected a green wire from this chest to this pole, then I'd have a distinct green signal with only the iron plates in this chest and that's that's really important to remember but when it comes to the calculations going on the green signal and the red signal are merged but it's a way of you keeping the data separate going backwards so that it doesn't uh, get a kind of flow back which might change the the logic not something you really need to worry about for just this moment now all this is doing is outputting a signal this one is actually outputting a green signal because we're above the required amount let's go across there we go. So the lights have now turned green because I'm outputting a green signal. Now, you might be wondering, why is it chosen to be green instead of yellow? Well, that comes down to the positioning of the colors in this grid. They will get preference 
first, they will get preference if they're a higher value. For example, if I was outputting a yellow two, I believe this would make it uh, yellow. Oh, no, it doesn't, actually. Okay, well, that's uh, something new then. Uh, it's a pure preference on the position then. So red will get preference over green, green over blue, blue over yellow, so on and so forth. So because yellow is a, a lower in the color priority, green is showing first. The fact that red outranks green doesn't matter because our red condition can never be true when the green condition is true. Uh, but it can be true when the yellow condition uh, would otherwise be true because the yellow is always true. So this just allows us to change the color. So let me just demonstrate it. There we go. It's red. There's one plate in there. The only time that this won't work is if this is actually if we make it equal to or greater than then there we are. It's perfect. When there's nothing in here as we can demonstrate by doing this. Take that out. It's red. Show me that there is there isn't enough supply at all. We put in a little bit and it's still red. We put in a fair bit, there we go, it's now yellow, put in all of it, turns green. Really, really simple little uh, little network, and it just gives you a color indication. You can, you can see at a glance from far away, especially if you're using the map, how the, the state is. You could just hover over the chest if you really wanted to. This is useful for all sorts of things. You can also set it up to read the belts directly. Now, there are times when you might want to do that, simply to see how much um, throughput, how much of uh, any particular resource is moving through the belt, not just stored, but is actively uh, in motion or, or back stuffed on a belt, all those kinds of things. And we can easily copy this over there if we want to set it up for for copper you can also not be specific about iron plates you could for example say anything just read whatever happens to be in the chest and and change the color based on that it's super super simple but you know i actually find that it, it's kind of useful for certain things but there we go we have researched that we're now going to research the signals and that's the last thing we're going to need before we actually get to setting up rails which will be very very important i'm going to take some of these right now let's have a look on our map right we're starting to see some biter bases uh, it's been a little while that looks like just two um actual spawners there and one spawner there so they're, they're two distinct bases more than likely uh where our pollution is nowhere near them my pollution is worrying me on this side and this side specifically because we're quite far uh we can't see um, into the fog of war there, but we're definitely getting within the sort of range where biter bases can spawn and the pollution is definitely spreading off the border there. The, the forest here, the tree line, is absorbing a lot of the pollution that's moving across here, but pollution can just travel very easily across desert. There's nothing to impede its progress, so we might want to worry about that. There's a decent amount of trees around here, so I'm going to say we're probably safe in that direction. So the most likely place that we're going to be attacked from is on this side. So let's go ahead and set up a little bit of a uh, defense down there. And I'm just going to quickly set this up because this actually isn't that useful if it's only running that one chest. But before we uh, moved off, I've set up the copper um, properly and I've also wired up all three chests on each side. So it's now giving us a more accurate readout of our current uh, stockpile of those components. Right, we want to safeguard our... Ooh, um, I'm noticing that that is not properly uh, uh, supplying the belt. Let me just quickly make sure that this belt is getting a decent amount of material on either side. There we are, that's a bit better. Now we're doing fine for power still. Okay, so as I mentioned, we are likely going to have to be dealing with some attacks from this direction. The only place where we're likely to see it is just over there, but we've got a bit of a uh, pollution bleed over here as well. We are lucky with the position of the trees. But just so that I can expand a little bit further without having to worry too much about the main base being attacked, let's set up a little area for ourselves. Now, I'm a very big fan of having my defense areas be largely automated. What I am not a fan of, however, is having lots of bullets on belts. Now, you may have seen me do that in previous uh, setups, just having a belt running the whole perimeter of my base, just constantly full of ammunition. Now, there are pros and cons to that. The, the biggest pro is there's always ammunition, assuming the belt is completely full. 
available for a gun turret to just pick up wherever it is. The biggest con about it is that you've got a massive amount of ammunition just sat on belts, not actually doing any work, and it is there to be destroyed. If a biter destroys the belt, then that ammunition isn't useful for anything. Uh, it just goes up in smoke, and that might take uh, a fair bit of your resources with it, very much so in the early game, but especially true if you've got the, the later tiers of ammunition. We can now get um, uh, uranium ammunition. Now, one nice thing about the turrets, much like the science labs, is they can take from uh, each other. So we can move, we can just have a single chest supplying ammunition to one turret, and then that will daisy chain all the way down. I like to try and get my turrets in a, in a bit more of a concentration, though. I feel that is, generally speaking, a little bit more useful overall. Now, the way that I like to set these little uh, turret bases up has changed somewhat and this little setup right here ammo will be delivered down there it'll go into one chest and that'll supply a cluster of six turrets that are that are quite tightly packed so if there is an attack then the turrets will will uh, be able to deal with it quite quite efficiently there's a lot of firepower here i also like to be able to see what's going on uh, around my fire bases now you could hook uh, a, a similar colored light display up to these chests just to give you uh, an idea from a glance what the kind of ammo supply is available to your guns and i think we're going to be doing that but before we get down to that let's go ahead and hook all of this up with some power poles i don't think we need those on my hotbar for what we're building right now so let's take them off and as soon as we start seeing those there we are perfect now what would be the best way to set this one up actually that is not too bad that uh, all ties in quite quite nicely and then we'll have uh, another one just down there to hook that all up. All of our inserters are working. Now, as you can see, I am belting ammo to this, and I've just mentioned that I don't really like doing that. Ah, there is a caveat, and we'll get to that in a moment. We will be setting up an automated supply of ammunition, but just to uh, demonstrate the system for now, let's uh, actually set this up down here just so that we can box in the uh, ammunition and i can demonstrate this system at work i won't actually uh, uh hook that up to power yet just so that we can do a little bit more now we could have this ammo box actually hooked up to uh, a light system much the same as we've done previously and i would say here we don't need it to be quite as uh, as expansive as, as the um the five light system but there's also no particular reason not to but i think three is more than enough for the sort of ammo supplies we're going to be having in here we don't want this full of ammo because one chest full of ammo is exactly the same as a belt full of ammo that is it's kind of like having your money in uh, i don't know putting credit into a shop into a shop account because you spend there occasionally well that's all well and good but your money is in their bank doing them good not in your bank doing you good it's not available for you to do anything with unless you happen to want to buy something at store it's much better for you to have that money available to you to use on different things rather than all cooped up in one place that you might touch occasionally but in and of itself isn't doing anything so we generally want to limit how much uh, ammo is being stored here and for this i'm actually going to move down some more cables because we're probably going to set up a system that is a little bit more complex now the the simple thing here we're hooking up the chest to our uh, inserter now that's fine for now but we don't strictly want this running on ammo at the moment that is fine. We're only, we've only got one type of armor, but as you may recall, I did mention that there are three different types. There's armor-piercing ammo, there is also um, uranium ammo, so we've got three types in total now. Let's say, at most, I would like a hundred rounds, uh, sorry, a hundred, uh, let me just pop over here, I, I'm not entirely sure, there are a hundred magazines. Each one has ten um, rounds in there. So we'll set that up, and that will now only activate if we set that to activate when there's less than 100 in there. And if we just jump in 200, that's currently turned off. There we go. So that's not going to uh, to do us any harm having that set up, and we'll grab a little bit more out there. There we go, just so that this is actually active. But it is reading this in there at the moment. However, if we wanted to do something, for example, 
If we assume that only ammo can be on this belt, now that's always a bit of an issue. If you assume anything, you're opening yourself up for some problems. But let's just say, for argument's sake, only ammunition can ever be on this belt. So it's not that we're worried about random pieces of rock or coal ending up in here. It's just that we want to make sure that it's only ammunition that ends up in there. Uh, I am actually going to pop a power pole just down there simply because uh, I like my walls to be a little bit further out from my turrets rather than right up next to my turrets because some biters, especially later on, can, can do damage through that. Uh, but if we want to, for example, say any type of ammo, then we're going to need a different, uh, I believe an arithmetic combinator is what we're going to want. Let's grab this. Now, we're going to be getting into something which... Honestly, I, I feel probably is one of the biggest confusing elements of, of the circuit network. And that is these. Now, you may have noticed on some of them, there are different ones. For example, we've got everything there, anything, and each. You'll have different ones available to you depending on what you're hooking up. But as a general rule, everything applies its condition to everything and and by everything i mean every individual piece of data in the chest if you recall we had plates uh, of both copper and iron and they were treated as separate pieces of data they weren't just saying yeah there's this much metal in the chest they were saying there's this much iron and this much copper and these are two separate pieces of information that it was remembering if we said everything less than 200 then this would remain true even if we had 400 iron in there but just three copper because it will only trigger if every piece of data that it can see matches the criteria. Anything is the opposite. Anything in there would match it. If we had two copper and 100 iron and the condition was be active as long as anything is less than 100, the moment we had 100 iron in there, it would turn off. So far, so sensible. Each works a little bit differently in that each will treat every piece of data as a separate calculation. So rather than trying to, to bundle everything in and just look for whatever might um, uh, work on, on the condition, this will apply the condition and, and the conditional statement to every bit of information going in. And when you use that with an arithmetic combinator, you get a, a specific type of uh, opportunity. Right now I'm saying for each item that comes in, multiply it by one. It's basically keep it the same, but do this operation on every bit of data that comes in. We'll hook it up because it'll be a little bit easier to follow if I actually demonstrate it. Uh, there we go. So we'll hook that up to green. And right now, uh, how much ammo we've got moved through? We've actually got a reasonable amount. I'm going to pop a chunk of ammo back in there, but I'm also going to pop some belts in there, and I'm also going to pop some uh, coal in there. Uh, sorry, stone. Coal, my lord. Uh, we'll make this a nice even 200. There we go. So right now, we've got 100 belts, 50 ammo, 50 stone being fed in. And it's multiplying each of them by one. That's fine. Now, if I said output each, then we can see down the bottom, it's now outputting. There's 100 belts in there, there's 50 ammo, and there's 50 stone. However, if I decide to use something else, let's use A for ammo, signal A. It's now saying there's 200 things in there. It's performed the operation of multiply each signal by one, thus you know, returning whatever value is currently there, but it is now summing all of that together to create a brand new signal of A. And this would stand for ammo. So if you imagine instead we had 50 regular ammo, 100 piercing ammo, and 50 uranium ammo, it would now just see that we had 200 ammo in the chest. And that is exactly what we want. So instead of feeding that in there, we're going to feed it like this. There we go. So this now sees that we've got ammo in there. And as long as the ammo is under 100, this should remain active. And currently, there's 50 ammo in there. And just to demonstrate, once again, pop that in there, it turns off because now it's met the condition of whatever's in the chest, there's that amount. Uh, so that in and of itself, you know, it's kind of useful, I guess, but not particularly great. We'll, we'll build to, to what I have in mind. Again, with combinators and with logic, you could just brute force it, and in many cases, you'd make a simpler system, and it would probably be just as good. It, it, would, it would do everything you want, but I like being able to play around with combinators. I like to be able to make a smart factory that does things in what I consider a smart way. 
Uh, now, what would we like to invest our research time in right now? Uh, well, actually, since we're talking about ammo, perhaps we should go ahead and research piercing ammo. There we are. So, this little system would take any ammo moving down the belt and feed it back in. That's great. But, let's be a little bit more intelligent with it. Now, we're going to need a lot of belt, unfortunately, for this one. This is not going to be a particularly uh, good system right now until we've got a, a better setup for our overall uh, factory. But, again, I would want the belt running the perimeter of the base. I just don't want the belt constantly full of ammo that isn't necessary yet. So, we'll draw this all the way back down here. We're going to set up some ammo manufacturing over here. Much the same as we got down here, this is just my personal stash that I always want to have available for me for always. Over here though, we're going to set up something new. Let's go ahead and grab my assembly machines. There we go. There and there. That'll do fine. And I've also got a text. Sorry about that. Right, there we are. And these will feed onto this belt. Nice and simple. Pretty much exactly what we've got going on down there. We'll need to run a little bit more uh, iron up here as a result and uh, if we actually bring these in a little bit closer we can save on power poles there we go so there we are iron will be fed in we already know that this is how this system works so we don't need to set it up uh, just yet in fact we'll just take that away for now just so that it isn't uh, actually, we haven't provided power. It's not live anyway. That's fine then. Right, so there we go. So this will... Ideally, what we want is this should... The base should only produce ammo when ammo is required. When ammo has been signaled that the system requires ammo because one of the bases hasn't got a full supply or that base has recently engaged the enemy, it requires ammunition to be fabricated. I love the idea of having some sort of fully automated quasi-intelligent base. It's never going to be strong AI, but it can be definitely a form of, of weak AI. And just in my head, you know, the, the, this sort of like mechanical masculine voice in, in the distance, it, you know, alerting that uh, the enemy is being engaged and suddenly this massive ammo wing of the factory just turns on. Previously, it was lying completely dormant. All the lights were off. We can't do that yet. We need power switches, but we can actually do that later on. And then just suddenly, this huge part of the factory just comes alive and, and metal starts being loaded, ammunition starts being manufactured, put in, into belts. It would be grand. Uh, this, this is where my mind goes when I'm playing Factorio, and I like it. I like it like this. Uh, eventually, we will also have uh, different types of ammunition being made. But we've just researched uh, better uh, military, so we now can set this up. We haven't yet made steel, and that is definitely something we should look into. Uh, another thing for our trains, we'll get uh, a, um, a setup for gates as well. So, right now, we can't do too much. We need to actually hook all of this up to a network of sorts. Now, I'm going to have this network running along the belt all the way along. We're going to need this because I want to send the signals back. Later on, when you've got logistics capabilities and, and robots flying around your base, then you can do this in different ways. The, the logistics system can just request a robot, but I'll be perfectly honest, I never like having bases that do that, even though that is a really, really good way of doing it. I'm not going to say it's not. By having that set up, you're actually going to save yourself a lot of problems in the form of um, the, the, the strain on your base from belts. But we want to completely disconnect this. I don't want this powered from over here. Well, actually, we can allow it to be powered, I suppose. Uh, what we don't want is, I, I bet that has actually connected the power up over there, hasn't it? Uh, no, it doesn't look like it has, unless it has. Let me zoom right in close. No, thank goodness. I, ha, ha, I didn't set up the factories. Uh, I was accidentally clever. That's the best kind of clever, honestly. We don't need this now. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that you can all trust me that that's, you know, it would load the, the ammo uh, as it was passing through correctly. So what do we want to do here? We already know how much ammo is in the chest. That's a very important piece of information. Let's send that back along the, the line. Now, the thing is, if we had multiple of these combat stations along the line, as I mentioned, um, logic bleed through or, or, or uh, feedback. If we had all of these running on, on green cables just along this power network, which is exactly what we need it to do um, in the grand scheme of things. Can we get it all the way? Yes, we can. 
Brilliant. If we had a second one down here doing exactly the same thing, saying, oh, well, I've got 200 ammo, and this one is saying, I've got 50. The problem is, is that because it's, it's, it's just putting A onto the green wire, that signal will merge. It would also feed all the way back to the inserter itself. Now, this inserter would suddenly be saying, yeah, I've got 250 ammo in the chest. It's got 50. It's just looking at the information that other um, parts of the network are feeding to it. So what we want is to isolate this signal. And there's a very, very, very simple way to do that. And again, it is with the arithmetic combinator. You can actually do it with all sorts of different combinators, but I find this one uh, particularly eloquent. So we don't want this to be up on this power pole just yet. We want these power poles strictly used for carrying the signal along the network and all the way back up to our factory. So instead, we'll place this just down here, about there, and we'll connect that up. There we go. All we want is for each, multiply by one, output each. Doesn't matter, A goes in, A comes back out at exactly the same amount. However, this is now a completely distinct signal, uh, circuit network. If you hover over any anything, any part of the circuit network it's attached to will be highlighted. So in this case, these green wires are highlighted. Over here, both of them are, but over here, only the ones coming out of the output of that arithmetic combinator are highlighted. We're now passing back how much ammo is available at this one base. Now we want that signal to start merging now that it can't interfere with this base's uh, internal operation. Externally, I do want to know how much total ammo is being stored across all my bases. We'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, we'll wire these lights up later. I don't think that's actually strictly necessary. What we want here, though, is I need to know when a base picks up ammo, because I don't just want to flood the line with ammo until all of my bases have gotten their ammo. And there's a very good reason for that, and this is a reason why this line is so long to demonstrate this. Let's say this place hasn't got enough ammo. It sends the signal, I need more ammo. I'm, I haven't got a full inventory to my uh, am ammunition manufacturers. They start putting ammo on the belt. Great. That's exactly what I wanted to do. However, if it just needed one magazine, this would make one magazine. Signal is still saying it needs one magazine. That magazine starts its journey. In the time that it would take that one magazine to get down here and thus satisfy the, the, the request for ammunition, this place would probably have made another hundred and they'd all be on the belt. Thus, I've, I've created a monster. My belt is flooded with ammo we don't need. My base has been wasting resources. Uh, so instead, what we can do is specifically tell the, the system when we pick up ammunition. Now this, I want on a different line. And I want it to go straight from this inserter. I want this inserter, now that we've set her up, to read its hand contents on a pulse. Every time it picks any item up, that should be uh, uh, signaled down the network saying, yeah, I've grabbed something. We're good. Now, if we send it just as is, it'll just say, I've picked up a piece of ammunition. Uh, for example, a, a regular magazine or a uh, an armor piercing magazine or a uranium magazine, and I've loaded it into the chest. Great. That's marvelous. But we could, again, just combine all of this. I don't actually care what you pick up. I just care that something was collected. Uh, we'll get to that, though, in time. We don't actually need to worry about that just yet. Now, what I would like to do is to run all this all the way back, all the way up here, and I'll show you why I care that that um, inserter is telling me that it's picked something up in addition to me knowing exactly how much it's got in that chest. Okay, so the factory is currently sending a signal of um, the ammo being uh, that, that is currently stored in the chest and also potentially a signal when the inserter arm picks up any ammo off the belt. Now, what are we going to do with that information? Well, I am glad you asked. First and foremost, I would like this particular signal to have a constant um, combinator. We're going to place this down. I want to tell the system how much uh, ammo should be stored in it. Now, there's lots of ways you can do this. I'm going to choose the number of wooden chests on the system and the amount of ammo that should be in any particular chest. Let's call this one D. D for desired um, or demanded, if you like. I'm going to say I want 100 ammo 
in any chest and currently there's only one chest on the system now i do it this way you could skip this step entirely and just give this the overall number but i like doing it this way and letting the system work out the numbers for itself uh, so we're going to need another arithmetic combinator and we'll place this one right here and all i want from here is the number of chests multiplied by the demand and that will give me the true demand we'll we'll just still call it demand that's fine again this one doesn't need power but the arithmetic combinator does so we'll just pop a little bit of power over here for us so there we are it's currently telling me i need 100 if i said right i've now got three different fire bases on there we're now up to 300 so on and so forth very simple i change one number and everything else is calculated or later on if i decide well i i want to change the amount i'm demanding in each one then i can do that and you can do all sorts of other other bits and bobs there so currently we know what our demand is now what we want to do with that is have a decider combinator and i'm actually going to have to go and pick up some uh, electronic circuits because uh, we're going to be building quite a lot more making all of this uh, circuit uh, network does kind of drain the electronic circuits unfortunately but we'll keep things moving got a nice backlog of resources there good 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 right what we'll do now the decider combinator is fairly fairly simple all we want from you and we'll use green wires for this one as well bring those down there if the amount of ammo is less than the amount desired then i would like to output a green signal it's that simple i'd like to know how much uh, ammo we have oh well, actually the ammo we have is on the green circuit network so let's not cross these signals let's connect that up there so now i'm feeding it information on on exactly um how much ammo is available and also feeding it how much is desired but they're not crossing those those cables it's not necessary in this case but it's a good habit to get into just to keep your your circuit networks clean so there we are it's saying yeah i need i need power activate the uh the manufactorum for the ammo in a suitably um mechanical voice something deep like that i feel my bass would be very aggressive sounding um only more mechanized there we go they're suitable for the god emperor uh there we are so that would then theoretically pass on and these would would kick into operation or it would flick the power switch and suddenly all of these would be getting power and it would it, the, the machines would come to life but we don't want to be doing that um too too easily there now what i would like to do is currently this is telling me how much is desired and that's just feeding straight in and uh, this it would create the problem that i mentioned earlier where we've just got a, a loads of magazines on the belt but we only really requested two okay so what are we going to be doing with the input going through well we're going to be counting how much ammo is on the belt and then we'll be factoring that into this calculation so for this one we're going to need two arithmetic combinators and the the logic behind this is fairly straightforward thankfully now we need one there one there this one will be counting how much is there and what we're basically going to make here we're making a memory cell so in here i'm going to say um well we're we're requesting ammo the um, ammo available so i'm going to use that same signal the amount of ammo that's currently available to the system so even though our chests are saying well there's this much ammo in the chest if there's ammo on the belt that should also be included in the signal so uh multiply it by one don't do anything and output itself now to create a memory cell simply connect it there we go if one goes in then it stays in there and it feeds back if you're constantly feeding information you're creating a counter this will increment um every cycle it'll get bigger that is exactly not what we desire but what we can do is much as we set up the inserters back at the uh, ammo supply area we want to set these ones up we like uh, like so and i want this when when it uh, reads anything just a pulse when it reads anything just a pulse no particular restriction on how they work they they're free to operate if this if this has materials go ahead make it and then put it on the belt and this will uh, let me know that that has happened and i want this to feed in down here to the input so when this does something this will increase by one currently it's got no signal so let's go ahead uh, actually input a well input each that's fine this way whatever ammo is put on the belt 
it'll get uh, added to an A signal and then um, fed back to itself. So just to test this, we want this to make ammunition. I'm going to remove these for the time being. And this requires four iron plates. Fairly easy. I'll give you four iron plates of my own if I had four. There we are. So we want one iron plate. Bump. There we are. This will pulse once. And now this is remembered. One ammo is currently on the belt. Currently, it doesn't know how to uh, work out if something has been taken off the belt, but as a, a proof of concept, in fact, I'll just dump a load of iron in here and we'll get both of them going. There we are. And bump. There we are. And this will pulse a couple of times. So it's currently at two, three, four. Now, as I mentioned, it has, it isn't getting any way of working out that anything has been taken off the belt. So we've currently, uh, mess the system up a little bit there but it's very easy to correct you just disconnect that wire and it forgets everything you had previously counted so there we are we've got a memory cell that is counting up how much ammo is being loaded onto the belt what we want over here is take each so for example the ammo that's currently available multiply it by one uh, sorry negative one so we'll get the opposite of that uh, so over here, we want the red line feeding in. There we go. So every time we get a pulse of any ammo being picked up, it'll be multiplied by minus one. So you'll get one pulse. So that's now saying minus one and output that as A. And we want that to feed in down here. So there we go. This will simply reduce the amount that is being... Um, that's on the belt by one every time something's picked up. And we can easily test that by setting up a very simple little crate down here. There we go. Hook that up. Tell it to pulse when it reads anything on the network. And that should work. Let's give that a test then. I feel confident, but uh, that is, the, you know, confidence always comes before a fall. All right, let's see. So it knows that there's one magazine on the belt right now. Two, three... And this should go down. Oh, oops. I forgot to say that, that could run whenever. There we go. As that picks anything up, it should go down. Let's shut these off for now, just by rotating them. And we'll get to see it a little bit. So it's currently at six and should go down to five. There we go. And you can assume, uh, or rather, you can trust me. I hope that that would work along the whole signal. So that system works. It remembers how much ammo is on the belt and then it outputs that amount of ammo down here as well. So what I would like this to do is using the green signal so that we're not um, confusing our network, tell the system how much ammo is also on the belt. There's, it's currently saying, well, I've got 55 at the moment. Not exactly right because we've confused the system. So again, let's just reset that. There we go. And then this should now be perfectly capable of understanding what's going on. So we want this on a green signal to feed out to these two. And these should only be enabled when there's a green signal. When the green signal is greater than zero. And that is all we need to do. There we go. And we've now got smart ammo being loaded onto the belt only when it is actually required. So let's hook that system up and we should see it underway. And this will announce that ammo is being loaded. And there we go. Uh, I'm going to let it feed the belt a little bit. And we'll pop down to our little firebase and see that it's actually working. Because it's going to take a, a little while for all of this to get down the belt. But that is a what I would consider a very simple, smart system. It took me a while to, to set up and obviously explain. I hope I explained it correctly. But using that, you can, if you want to, go the more my factory is smart rather than it's strong i mean hopefully it's both but uh, work smart rather than work hard is the philosophy that i use when i'm playing factorio and it yeah nine you know eight times out of ten maybe even nine times out of ten i'll make something that isn't actually improving the efficiency of my factory in any way in fact it would be faster and more efficient if i just did the brute force method 
But I like having the factory think for itself. And again, in the back of my head, there's this masculine mechanical voice just announcing that, you know, the East Wall is under attack. And so it, it fires up the forges and the foundries, starts making all weapons of war and dispatching them to the East Wall. Ah, it'll be great. In my head, Factorio is, is, is a much more cinematic game. Ah, wonderful. Here we go. We can actually see um, the information on the network right now. We've currently got... Uh, it's announcing that there are 80, uh, sorry, 90 pieces of ammo. When this picks it up, it should say, it should uh, go down and then go back up immediately because the ammo box has received uh, some ammo and stored it in. Now, as soon as this gets to 100, the system should shut down. So we'll stop seeing it deploying more, more ammo. They, we might get a little bit more just as a result. But yeah, 101, it might have gone to 102. Now, I am accounting for that little bit of overflow. One or two magazines is certainly better than, than several thousand just stuffed on a belt. But you may have already spotted the, the key weakness here. If this was running low on ammo, and it took that long for the ammo to get there, yeah, there's a bit of a problem with that. Also, ammo can be used asynchronously, so uh, having it on a, on a bit of a looped belt is a, a good idea, but we'll, we'll get to that. As you can see, this is missing some of the ammo, and this ammo just isn't going to be useful, so we do need to take that ammo back. So let's go ahead and set something up for that right away. Will that work? Yes, it will. Perfect. So this will run the length of the perimeter. Now, what are we going to do with this ammo? Well, what I would like to do is any ammo that is unused at the end of the belt just gets stored for later and basically can act as an additional source of ammunition rather than just having my, my factories having to uh, make it on the fly. So we'll have a little area just back here for storing the ammunition and then redeploying any leftovers. Later on, on a much, much larger perimeter if we actually had the full perimeter covered i'd have little ammo caches which would effectively be a mirror of what we're going to do here uh we'll be very optimistic and assume that we're never going to have more than this much waste uh we'll actually need an extra power pole here unfortunately but that's fine and then this can just be fed down and then we'll create a little belt balancer just to make sure the best of the belt the 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 most of the belt is being used so this little area back here as ammo is picked up here it should still send a pulse letting us know that that ammunition has been collected read hand contents now this one should pick it up if it gets here it should always pick it up but this one should only deploy it for much the same reasons that these do so i want pretty much exactly the same settings over there and these ones are currently hooked up to the green signal so let's send that green signal down here there we go that ammunition will get dumped onto the belt and it'll it'll have a little bit of bleed through but that's fine for now on the whole this system is now working and yes setting up this system took like an entire episode but I think it's a pretty cool system, and we got to uh, demonstrate the sorts of things you can do with circuit networks if you are so inclined. You do not need to do it like this, as I have stressed. If you just want to brute force it, you'll probably get it done faster. And there are pros to just having ammo immediately available, but that's what we're trying to do with the chest. The ammo is immediately available to the guns, and then as the chest starts to tick down, the ammo factories will top it back up. Ideally, you should set this to an amount that realistically, even with a big attack wave, the guns will never run out of ammo before ammo starts getting, uh, reaching to uh, that chest and, and resupplying it. That would be the ideal situation. Now, off camera, I'm going to go ahead and set up a couple more of these turrets just along a perimeter and probably even set them up with some lights just so that we've got a visual indication of how much ammo is available to any chest. And you can even set it up to tell you what type of ammo. In fact, that would be extremely simple. And I might even do that now just as a demonstration. So uh, we could say, yeah, this, this turret has access to regular ammo if, uh, let's see... We'll grab this on a red signal, and it's really this simple. Uh, use colors. We, we actually do want it to use colors, so uh, let's make another three combinators here. There we are. We want it to use colors. This one should activate if that is above zero. 
this one should activate if this one is above zero and this one should activate if we've got uranium uh, rounds available to us. Pop these down. In fact, we could even have uh, these lights a little bit closer to the whole system if we really wanted to, and that would be fine. There, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, just pop those in there. There we are. We'll have this feed across. And these ones actually need to be isolated because I only want the color going to one particular light. So this one will be sending a yellow signal. This one will be sending a red signal. This one can be sending a green signal. And once again, use colors. And this one should only show if we've got any amount of ammunition in there. This should be piercing rounds. And this one should be uranium rounds. So very, very easily, I can see, okay, we have got ammo there because the light is on. If there are no lights, panic stations. But if there are lights, that's all well and good. And this allows me just to recycle my ammo. Ammo does tend to get used up. There's, there's really no reason to be running this on, on just regular ammo if you've got piercing ammo. Unless, perhaps, certain bases are not being attacked by as, as difficult fighters. But uh, the more information, the happier I am. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. We didn't really get to setting up our rail line as I had hoped. But in the next episode, we will indeed be doing that. And uh, off camera, while I'm setting these things up, I'm just going to start increasing the effect of our ammunition for as much as we can, which is basically two tiers in each one. But I'm afraid with that, we have definitely run out of time for this episode. Please do let me know down in the comments below if you have any questions on what I've shown or if you just have feedback on how I've shown it. Am I explaining combinators correctly or perhaps if you're just not interested too much in the combinator network side of things that kind of feedback would be very very useful for me going forward but that's gonna be it from me so until next time and as always do take care everyone